Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. A woman can be a real person on screen. You don't have to make someone likeable and have their sort of likability dial up to number 10 in the test screenings for an audience to root for them or engage with them. Hello, listeners. Welcome to 2021. Happy New Year. If you have tuned in to In the Envelope today for a dose, perhaps, of creative inspiration, a look behind the scenes of a very talented artist's creative process, or just because you are a fan of Carrie Mulligan, (laughs) welcome. You are in for a treat. It's hard to think of a more fortuitous start to 2021 than having our first in the envelope episode of the year be Carrie Mulligan, who of course is um, very talented. This, I mean, this is this is the big leagues, guys. Carrie Mulligan is this is A grade. This is a real actor's actor. I assume she needs no introduction. Uh, I have, of course, recorded our little bio uh, for her, so stay tuned for that in just a second. But. Um, She uh, proves why she is such a brilliant actress in this interview, and it was really cool to speak with her about her process and how it it varies from project to project. She's played such an amazing kind of wide variety of roles on stage and screen and uh, is getting a lot of really well-deserved awards buzz for Promising Young Woman, which if you haven't had a chance to see it, see it somehow, some way. It is one of the best movies of the year. It's so much fun. And um, do stay tuned after this lovely interview to hear from our casting insider, Christine mckenna Torella, who, as always, has backstage casting listings for those of you who are working actors that you should know about. Check out the recent issue of Backstage. Um, it also includes fun tips from Secret Agent Man on making New Year's resolutions. Uh, stick around, as always, for Christine's segment because she speaks to that beautifully. I think that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for joining us in the new year. And Carrie Mulligan is just the beginning. I'm very excited to uh, reveal to you all, faithful listeners, who is coming up on this podcast. And without further ado, let's take a quick break and get to Carrie Mulligan. For your awards consideration, Perry Mason, the must watch HBO original drama series starring Emmy winners Matthew Reese, Tatiana Maslani, and John Lithgow. When a gruesome murder case falls into Mason's lap, uncovering the truth means exposing a city full of corruption, and everybody is guilty. Catch up on the drama IndieWire calls one of the most beautiful series ever made, and Rolling Stone raves is filled with great performances. All episodes now streaming on HBO Max. To pursue her dream of becoming a working actor, Carrie Mulligan used to write letters to filmmakers asking for advice. After making her screen debut in Pride and Prejudice and acting on stage in her native London, Carrie broke out with her Oscar-nominated work in an education, going on to star in Never Let Me Go, Shame, The Great Gatsby, Inside Lewin Davis, Mudbound, Wildlife, and this year's The Dig and Emerald Fennel's feminist revenge thriller, Promising Young Woman. Here's our interview with the lovely Carrie Mulligan. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? 
I'm all I'm all right. <laughs> I was about to say I'm great, but that seems so disingenuous this year. So I'm fine. <laughs> yes. How's your 2020? All things, you know, as far as years go. All all things considered, I feel like we've we've got off relatively lightly. Um, so mm. it's been fine. But it's just getting to that point, isn't it, where everyone's just sick of it. So I mean, I think people were sick of it a long time ago, but now we're really sick of it. Yes. In a whole new way. And you have two films that were filmed before all of this. Yes. So that and has sort time. of Yeah. That has sort of affected your year, I'm guessing. And and what else do you have on the what else is coming up? And what was sort of interrupted by the pandemic? Well, nothing was interrupted apart from the release of Promising Young Woman, which was about two or three weeks away from coming out. Right. So we did a bunch of magazine covers that came out to no film right. oh, <laughs> earlier yeah. in the year, um, uh. which was cool. Um, and then, yeah, so it was just that really, it was that. And there was, it, I hadn't sort of set on anything particular work-wise to do. Um, so that was good. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just the release of these two films in the next year doing Bradley Cooper's um, Maestro, which is wonderful. Yeah. Do you think the events of 2020 have affected your um, craft? They've affected you as a person and that will inform your future work? Well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I might have forgotten how to act. I mean, I haven't <laughs> done anything for a really long time now and I always feel a bit rusty after a break. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel so lucky that I've, you know, I have had a relatively easy ride in this whole thing and people have had such a rough time. Um, and I've got two small kids so mm -hmm. it's been a sort of, I, I felt like it's been quite a sweet opportunity to grab this time when they're very little, um, which obviously don't get back. So uh, I don't know. I think it, you know, every time you take a pause, I think it makes you think about your, you know, future stuff. And mm -hmm. But I'm I'm so excited about Maestro. So that's kind of been in my mind and I would yeah. have wanted a big hefty break before that anyway. So it's, yeah, I uh, think it's a good thing. Sure. So, I mean, of course, you've spoken to Backstage before, and, you, and I think you know our our deal at Backstage is I want to ask you everything about your craft and, and all of your career advice and all of that. You mentioned this idea of taking a break and then maybe getting rusty. Um, mm. What is your process? What are the things that you do? Are there things that you do every time for every role, or is it a completely different? Is it starting from scratch? Oh, man. It often feels like starting from scratch when I haven't mm -hmm. worked for a while. Um, but it does, it varies completely, um, from job to job, you know, because sometimes you just don't have any time, you know, with promising, we had a couple of months before, mm -hmm. you know, from when I sort of signed on to when it all came together, it came together really fast. Um, but with a dig, I replaced somebody with oh. about three or four weeks notice. So, um, there wasn't a huge amount of prep time. So I kind of had to jump in. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I've become a bit more flexible with that kind of stuff and it always helps to come from one job to the next I feel like you're sort of warmed up and ready to go but it's rough when you haven't oh. worked for a while and then you come into something because you do feel a bit creaky <laughs> yeah creaky is there ever the opposite thing where you've come too recently from another project and you're taking that character into the new character I don't think so. I, I generally find it kind of, you've just got, you get into a bit of a flow. I mean, the funny thing about most of the jobs that I do is that they are, you know, independent films that shoot mm. really quickly. So mm. um, they're almost mm. over before they've started. I mean, Promising Young Woman was 23 days. So um, wow. it was just so, so fast. Um, and I don't tend to work back to back a huge amount. Um, sometimes maybe theatre into film or vice versa, but not really sort of, you know, right. I don't do film after film, really. Mm -hmm. So the longest, yeah, and the, you haven't done as much long form, multiple seasons of a TV show. So maybe mm. the longest form of acting you've done is on is a stage show when you're doing it over and over again, right? Yeah, probably Skylight was 12 weeks um, mm. in London, 12 weeks in New York. Um, mm. oh, just the, the Seagull a million years ago that I did, we ended up doing a 16 week run because we extended by a month. Um, so that's right. probably the longest. Yeah. Hmm. I saw Skylight and it was it was magical in New York. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and of course, we, I, it's always fascinating to hear. I would love to hear your take on: Do you think of screen acting and stage acting as completely different? Again, are there are there commonalities in your approach and your process? Yeah, I don't really. I mean, I, I I've because I guess I never you know went to 
drama school or anything. Right. I've never sort of approached them very differently. I remember the first time I did a play, they had to sort of help me think about my voice in a way that I hadn't done before. But I did, a, I did my first two jobs. My first job was Pride and Prejudice. My second job was a play at the Royal Court. Mm -hmm. So um, I was so inexperienced. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so it was... Um, so they were they needed to sort of get me in shape to be able to be heard in like the third row. Oh, um, okay. But other than that, I don't really ever sort of feel I kind of hate like stage acting, like stage acting that feels very sort of theatrical and you know yeah. it's sort of. Um, so I I've never kind of felt much of a distinction between the two, and and again it's sort of it's when I did I did a monologue a couple of years ago called Girls and Boys um, mm. and when I did that I I did not one scrap of work until I showed up on the first day of rehearsals because I just had a baby mm. and my son was like not even five months old so I was just sort of mm. you know, happy to have dressed myself and, <laughs> and gotten in a cab <laughs> and got to work yeah. um, so it kind of I think it just has to you has to go with the flow a little bit with what's going on in your life sure sure um Take me back to the very beginning because, of course, you, so you didn't have the formal training, which we, I mean, I've actually, the mo most recent guests on this podcast have either not gone to school at all or been dropouts, dropout, dropping oh, wow. out of college. Yeah, um, that's cool. But I, yeah, but I feel like in the UK, <laughs> like for in the UK, especially maybe the theater, the acting community, is it kind of a no no to not go to to not go to training well it's funny i think it may be i think i felt like that a little bit when i started you mm -hmm. know so when i did my first play everyone in the cast was was classically trained they'd been to rod or they'd been right. to you know guild hall or somewhere very proper and i think i did feel a little bit like a chancer um having not been but it wasn't out i mean i tried i just didn't get in so it was like the effort exactly. I, I wanted to you know but i just um <laughs> i didn't get a place it's so competitive and so i do think um but i think that's changing and i think people are also understanding now that you know it's such a it's it's it, you know to the majority of of you know, kids who go to drama school are from a certain background of privilege and uh, a certain class. Yeah. And uh, and I think it's that's very um, limiting and um, exclusive mm -hmm. in a way that isn't massively good, I think, for storytelling and for our industry as a whole. Sure. So I think mm -hmm. that, you know, if there was any kind of stigma, it's certainly faded now. Gotcha. Totally. It's also just true. You can get on the job training and it's been said, especially for film work, you can't learn that until you're doing it. That's that's the kind mm. of work that you have to learn on the job. Was that sort yeah. of your experience with, what do you remember about Pride and Prejudice? Oh man, I just remember copying Jenna Malone, just anything Jenna did. <laughs> okay. I, so we essentially decided that those two characters were like twins. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that gave me a great opportunity just to copy her. Um, but she really did like basically like guide me through that whole film. Cause I had, it was my first ever job. I had no idea what to do or how to you know act on camera or you know I'd only been in school plays so um so I really lent so heavily on she was so sweet to me but the whole cast and we were a bunch of you know we were all between the age of like 18 and 25 the majority of the cast mm. um so it was incredibly good fun and mm. we stayed in lovely hotels and had parties and you know it was very kind of idyllic <laughs> Um, I, I think I thought that every film was like that with like delightful catering and, oh, sure. you know, <laughs> expensive hotel rooms and then was brought, <laughs> you know, smack back to reality later on when I started doing other work and realized it wasn't all quite so fairy tale. That's so, that's, that's exactly what we love to hear on this podcast. I feel like it's the, on, on paper, it would seem like a film like that would be your big break. And from then on, mm. it's smooth sailing. But you yeah. went back and you started to, you had to go back and do day jobs, right? You had to do survival jobs after that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was all great experience. Um, but yeah, you do the, you know, sort of murder mysteries and the procedurals and the, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, just, and, and I loved it and I never wanted to stop working. I worked all the time when I was younger. Um, and I did feel like I just got to, and I was very lucky because I end, I kept on ending up in these, these jobs where I didn't have a massive amount to do most of the time for the first two or three years of my career, but I was in it a lot and I was in scenes mm. with incredible actors. And so I just mm. got to sort of, you know, watch like Gillian Anderson and, 
yeah. um, you know, Charles Dance and Brenda Bleffin and all these people who were just so brilliant. And I, uh, but there was no focus on me. And so I could, it didn't really matter what I did. And that was very, that was really, yeah, helpful. Sure. And you, I, I've read that you experienced uh, quite a lot of resistance, I, I kind of in the lead up to Pride and Prejudice, a lot of um, people doubting your, is it safe to say, single-minded focus towards acting. <laughs> you were, you were gunning for acting. You, if you ever had a plan B, has it always been acting? Yeah, no, I never had a plan B. That was the problem. Um, I just ah, didn't okay. know what else to do. Um, mm. So I was, yeah, and you know, it's funny now. Now being a mum, I sort of, you know, it, it all clicks into place and you think of ah. course you don't want your kid to have a job that's potentially really unstable and could end in misery and you know <laughs> and also having done this now for like 15 years I've you know I've had so many friends and colleagues who are extraordinary actors who just don't happen to be in the right place at the right time don't get that one job yeah. that leads to the other job and you know so there, there's definite um you know it's definitely valid all of that stuff but it was kind of good I think it's you know it was good to have something to sort of fight against and um, mm. made me clear about what I wanted to do. But again, I mean, the, you know, the chances of being in the right place to get that job that got me into Pride and Prejudice, I mean, all of it was just so kind of ridiculously fortuitous. I, um, I, I get why my parents were sort of a bit nervous about the whole thing. Sure. And Julian Fellows told you outright to not pursue acting. Well, he said, if you're going to, you should sort of marry well. <laughs> Oh, um, which okay. is a very, which I think he was sort of, you know, I'm sure said with a hefty amount of irony, but essentially yeah. he was saying, look, this is, it is, it is incredibly difficult. Um, you have to know so, how difficult, you know, yeah. you've got to know that going in. Sure. And, and as you mentioned, you didn't get into those drama schools, which mm. is it safe to assume was devastating? I mean, it was not devastating enough to deter you. It was, but I also sort of felt like, I don't know, it was really competitive and I saw, because a lot of these drama schools, you audition in front of your fellow kind of competitors, or, you know, the people that you're kind of going up mm -hmm. against. I saw people and I was like, yeah, they're really good. I'm not as good okay. as that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It was, I kind of felt like, eh, fair enough. <laughs> um, but I, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of put me on a different path for that moment. I then sort of reapplied to university. I was going to go and study film, I think, or something, which is weird because mm -hmm. I'd never really been that interested in film. Um, but I was just sort of clutching at straws and it was in that year where I was sort of the year between finishing school and, and taking this place at university that I started sort of writing letters to try and find a way to, um, get into the industry without going to drama school. And the writing letters, I mean, that's such an interesting way of going about it. Did you have a, an example that you were setting yourself after, or was this all your own sort of idea? And no, it was just my, uh, yeah, I just sort of thought, I didn't know anyone who was even, you know, in, in any kind of creative industry. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I didn't, it wasn't just Julian. It was like, I went and did work experience at Tiger Aspect, a production company in London. I went and did work experience at mm -hmm. Ealing Studios as a runner. Um, so I did lots of sort of, but I think it was just, yeah. And it's so odd to think about writing letters now, <laughs> sort of well, 50, sure. like actually putting pen to paper. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it just sort of seemed like the only way I could get some advice or some help to to not have to, you know, go to university and do this course that I think ultimately I probably would have dropped out of pretty quickly. Um, so uh -huh. luckily I was, you know, people were just really generous with their responses. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and is, is that your advice to other actors who are currently in that early career position? Do you recommend, maybe it's not putting pen to paper, but that kind of relentless reaching out? Yeah, I just don't think it can hurt. I don't right. think anyone ever sort of gets sort of, I don't think it can do you any damage. And it could also be that you just, it happens to be that that day, you know, somebody's looking for someone just like you and you're going to do them a favor by solving that problem. So mm. I do think that's sort of essentially what happened with Pride and Prejudice was that they were looking for, you know, girls who looked quite young, who were, uh, who were sort of inexperienced. Joe wanted actors who had not, for those roles, you know, for a couple of those roles that had not sort of done much. So they didn't seem like sort of, mm. He wanted sort of fresh faces who people didn't know. So I was just really lucky to have gotten that. But you just, yeah, I guess it's, you know, it's always worth a go if you've got the energy mm. and the time to do it. I have to ask you about Promising Young Woman because 
I want to ask you about rage <laughs> and anger. <Fun. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And, and whether this maybe is oversimplifying though, to just ask about a specific, I don't even know if I want to put words in your mouth and call it an emotion, but mm. between that and even Lewin Davis and mm. um, wildlife, these depictions of, I think of it as rage. Again, I don't want to like, <laughs> or anger or, or, and I don't even know if you put words to it or think of them as emotions, but how do you play that? How, how do you approach that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it was part of what I was so excited about with all of those jobs. I, I love, um, seeing, uh, that, you know, these sort of kind of what are usually perceived as sort of negative things, ne negative mm -hmm. aspects of someone's personality um, on screen, particularly in women, because I just think it's so rare. Um, yes. And I loved that Jeanette was behaving in a way that I didn't totally understand mm -hmm. um, the first time I read the script. And it took me a while to understand why she was doing everything she was doing. And what it kind of came down to with her was this feeling of sort of opportunities missed and her life having mm -hmm. been you sort of taken from her in some way. And um and the frustration that that must lead to and therefore the anger and um i'm really interested in how our lives can kind of take shape without us even knowing that it's happening and i think mm -hmm. in, in some degrees that sort of ties all of those characters together but particularly for cassie and that she's I, I I don't think she's aware of quite how stuck in a moment she is. I think she feels like she's doing something proactive, but she's really not. Um, mm. She's going out every night. She's pretending to be drunk. And if somebody picks her up and takes her home, she then has this reveal where she, you know, reveals herself to be stone cold sober. And she gets this moment of gratification where she mm. feels like she's doing something useful and something that is, you know, that, and, and that guy will never do that thing again. And she gets this sort of, feeling of um satisfaction but i think it fades very quickly um yeah and and then the sort of need to do that again builds up so it's like she's yeah it's it's a and this the anger in her what was interesting about that is you know inside Lewin davis it's very fresh this is somebody who's recently been really scorned and really pissed off and really kind of can't mm. um can't can't keep it together with cassie the anger is sort of calcified in her yeah. it's been there for so long hmm. she's in kind of in control of it um in an odd way um so i found it really yeah really and it's also really fun you know a lot of that okay. stuff is, is really exciting and fun to play um because it also it's just you know the kind of thing that is not written into female roles very much oddly absolutely that's actually really good to hear that it's fun because that is an important ingredient in the process, right? A hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, and that's what Emerald and I, you know, connected on a lot is that we're both of the mindset that, you know, we are privileged to do the job that we wanted to do mm. when we were five years old. And yeah. um, mm. it, 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 you know, you can definitely find things difficult at work, but it ought to be fun. You know, it really is mm. sort of one of the most um, privileged positions to be in. So yeah, it was definitely fun. I mean, it's fun to smash up a car. There's no two ways about it. Like oh gosh, taking a yeah. crowbar to a car is just objectively really fun. If there's no consequences, <laughs> which, uh, yes. which obviously there aren't. Actually, side note, how many takes do you do when you have to do something like beating up a car? Well, uh, I mean, on this film, because it was, you know, we had a fairly limited <laughs> budget. I think they had three sets of tail lights that I was allowed to, so we did three uh -huh. takes. Three, three sets of tail lights and two, uh, like mirror, um, front, you know, front mm. windows that I could smash. That's not a lot of takes. It's not. No, I really had to bring the rage on the first take. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's quite fun. Quite fun. See, that's 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 really cool to hear. I mean, the other aspect of this that I wanted to ask about, without delving into your personal life, mm. but this speaks to the process of mm. where does that rage come from? Do you ever have to draw from your own personal experience? How mm. often are you calibrating a character with yourself and kind of mm. measuring the two against each other? Yeah, it's interesting. I sort of, I think I go back and forth on this because I feel like mm. the play that I did right after I had my second child was a was a very dark play about, it was a comedy at the beginning, but it's sort of, it was about family annihilation. It was about a woman who lost both of her children in a really violent way 
And I remember when it was offered to me, I was like nine months pregnant with my son. Oh, wow. And, you know, and my friends were saying like, is this a good idea for you to go and do this? And you've got a brand new baby and a little girl, like this mm. is, you know, it all feels very close to home. And I, and I definitely sort of felt a bit of trepidation, but actually doing the play, I never, and people would come backstage afterwards and say like, gosh, this must just be so, you know, how do you, it's so emotionally exhausting. Right. Um, but it didn't feel, I, it, I think when you really feel like you're kind of, I don't know, it just doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't kind of drain me. It's sort of, I, uh, if anything, I feel sort of better afterwards and I don't okay. connect it. And mm. I didn't think about my children. I thought about mm. these two characters, Leanne and Danny, and I'd sort of built their, and in fact, that was kind of a, like a rule I made before I went in like this, I'm not going to make mm. these two kids in the play, my children. Mm. Um, and I didn't, um, and so it didn't affect me. And I think similarly, that's, you know, that that's been my experience in lots of films where things haven't, I haven't, you know, com I've, I've built up a whole different world for that person and, and attached lots of things to, to that story. And, and certainly Nina in, in Promising Young Woman became like a really real person that, you know, we talked about a lot of who Nina was and what that relationship was. And Wonderful. So when she's, you know, talking about Nina, I wasn't thinking about my real life best friend or, mm. you know, it, it, so sometimes I think trying to link it to your own life can sort of end up, you know, going against you in a way. And often, I remember when I did The Seagull, Ian Rickson at the time was set, you know, essentially at one point, because I think I kept on, I kept on trying to link it to my life. Well, I can't remember, but I was just so scrabbling, having not trained, I didn't know how to approach a part like that. And he said, you couldn't possibly imagine this person's trauma. She, you know, she loses a baby and she's abandoned by, you know, the person that she's in love with. And you, you, you'll never, mm. you know, God willing, you'll never have that experience and you haven't had it. You can't, you can't draw from yourself. You're just going to have to invent someone. And so that's sort of how I've worked predominantly since then is just inventing. Mm. Um, and I, I like in Promising Young Woman, I could never imagine, doesn't matter, I could read all the books in the world. I'll never get close to imagining what it's actually like to have a friend who, you know, I lose in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, you do need to just invent. And I think that's also good because it's sort of, I don't know, it protects you in a good way. But at the end of the day, you can get in the car and like, go home and just leave Absolutely. it. You know? That was even my next, I, I was almost like, it, it protects you. It sounds like you consciously invent rather than use real life in order to make it, as you say, cathartic in a mm. healthy way. That's yeah. not cathartic in a way that's like, I have now been excavating my personal experiences and memories and transcribing yeah. them onto some work of fiction. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's, I, and I think I, I feel very strongly about my job and I love my job and it's the best job in the world, but I also, it is a job, you know, it's something that I, it, it can't yeah. be more important than when I get home and have to do bath time and you know, mm -hmm. so you just, there's no way you can, someone said the other day, do you like, did you bring Cassie home with you? And I was like, the nails I brought home, the hair extensions I brought home, but everything else, <laughs> you can't bring that into a house with two kids. It's just no. great. You know, you got to leave all that stuff at work. So it's, I think it's a system that works for me for now, but I think also that's the amazing thing about acting is everyone has such different approaches and I think it's sure. kind of whatever works for you. And this is the way that sort of works best for my life at the moment. So you don't have to do any post post-performance um, come down or any routine like that? No, I I generally go home and watch like, you know, America's Ninja Warrior or something really sort of, <laughs> sort of easy. And I don't, I can't read books when I'm working. I can't engage with anything particularly highbrow. I just want to watch, I want to oh. come home and like just watch things where I can turn my brain off. Um, and no, I, on Promising, I would just sit in the car with my assistant, Monica, and we'd just like talk about all the gossip from set all day. You know, everything that had gone oh on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was it, really. That was the sort of come down with like, ooh, did you hear about that guy? And, you know, the second assistant director or whatever, you know, it's just some random gossip. Uh -huh. um, As you say, yeah. not highbrow. The point is yeah. not to engage your, your intellectual side because the intellectual side is pretty preoccupied. Is that yeah, I think, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, and it's also, it's so, it's it, particularly on Promising Young Woman, it was just so much fun. You know, we were just having the sure. best time. There's dark stuff in the film, but there is also a lot of comedy and, and the cast mm -hmm. is full of comedians. So 
it was just sort of blowing my mind to be laughing so much at work every day, having come from quite a lot of quite heavy drama. Um, sure. You know, it was just like, I can remember saying to Bo Burnham on like day three, I can't believe how much fun this is. This is so fun. <laughs> Gosh, is this what it's like to, to be you all the time? <laughs> you know, just to be on a set where you're just laughing and having a lovely time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was just, it was really lovely. It's certainly, it's certainly fun for audiences as well. Yeah. It's definitely the twistiest movie I've seen this year. It's, it's, it's super, delightful. super twisty. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get involved? You are also the producer of this film. Yeah, so I was I was uh, I was given an executive producer title. I think principally because I came on sort of um, straight away, and um, mm -hmm. so yeah, Emerald sent it to me in January of two thousand and nineteen, and I think we started shooting it in April, late March maybe. Um, so it all came together really quickly. Um, and alongside the script that she sent me, she also sent me this Spotify playlist that she'd made that had oh Boys by Charlie XEX, that had mm -hmm. Paris Hilton Stars Blind, um, Britney Spears yeah. Toxic, Britney Spears yes. Toxic Instrumental. <laughs> and there yes. were sort of two versions of Toxic on the playlist, which, you know, really sort of um, gave me an idea of wh where she was going. And this, and this sort of mood board of, you know, a beautiful candy colored world of neon yeah. pink and sort of, you know, lavender tactile things. So um, she just had this complete clarity of vision from the first day and um, it all felt like it happened very quickly after that. So is, is there also a facility with Emerald as some, she's someone who has on camera experience? I think definitely. Um, she's also somebody who's just incredibly accomplished in so many ways. She's a published author, mm -hmm. screenwriter, showrunner, producer. You know, she directed a short film that was at Sundance. It was um, really brilliant, which is what I saw before we met. Um, and of course, she's an actress and has worked, you know, for as long as I have in mm -hmm. um, as an actor. And so I think she understands performance and she understands what it's like to be vulnerable in front of the camera and right um you know but yeah she was her her performance notes with everybody were just so spot on and also so clever um and i think my favorite one was one that she gave to the boys when you know adam brody um mm. who was playing one of our nice guys um came onto set she said you this is a romantic comedy and you are the hero and oh my gosh that, and so that's how he plays <laughs> the she was like, but in this romantic comedy, the girl just doesn't talk, basically, <laughs> which is not that far dissimilar from most romantic comedies where, you know, a guy oh, wow. falls in love with a girl for the sort of toss of her hair and her sparkling smile and she doesn't actually say very much. Um, the, that was the note for the boys was, you, you are the hero. This is your romantic comedy and you're going to marry this girl. And, you know, this is this is the beginning of a really beautiful love story. That so that's how... Of yeah. You know, and then, and then I loved how Adam Brody just committed to the to the <laughs> cinema's most one sided kiss in history. Mm. Just this, oh, just really, really toe curling moment in the film where he, yeah. um, you know, Adam's character kisses Cassie, and she's just not doesn't move a muscle, and he engages mm. in this sort of very passionate kiss. And you know, it, it was that was Emerald's direction. He just needed to be wholeheartedly, you know, pursuing mm. that role and. Um, just all of her direction is so brilliant but that I, I think and even in the casting of those guys it was so smart because you associate mm. all of those guys with just like warmth and good memories sure. and you know nice things and that turned wow. very quickly i had not thought of this idea of the rom romantic comedy that it absolutely is playing into romantic comedy tropes before completely pulling the rug out from under it. Like, <laughs> yeah. This episode is brought to you by HBO. For your awards consideration, the critically acclaimed HBO film, Bad Education, starring Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney. Vox calls their performances stellar as Long Island school district supervisors who find themselves in the center of a scandal. Don't miss what IndieWire calls a masterful and diabolically smart crime story. Bad Education, now streaming on HBO Max. How much are you thinking about, going back to this idea of this is not something we typically see, particularly with female roles, mm. are, is this a guiding light for you? You want to take on <laughs> female or feminine roles that subvert 
audience expectations? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that's certainly interesting. That's certainly one of the most you know exciting things about this film was that you you're never on uh, safe ground. Really, you think you okay. are, and then you know you do get the rug pulled out from underneath you. Um, but I I'm just really interested in playing women that feel real, you know, and. I'm sort of fascinated by this idea of the unlikable woman um, having mm-hmm. sort of played a couple of roles where, um, you know, there's been a sort of interesting reaction to the role, particularly in wildlife, um, you mm-hmm. know, releasing that film was so interesting because there certainly was this feeling that Jeanette was kind of the character that they was sort of a bad person. Um, and I felt really <laughs> defensive of her because I felt like mm. she wasn't. And, um, mm. and, and I think, you know, it was just this, because we aren't used to seeing women on screen, you know, sort of quote unquote misbehaving, it felt like um, that was something that was sort of provoking these sort of strange reactions. And I do think, um, I think that, but I think there's sort of a real shift happening where we're, we're much, there's a big, a bigger audience now for seeing sort of mm-hmm. real interesting women on screen. I think that's, we've seen that in Fleabag and we've seen that yeah. in I May Destroy You where that mm-hmm. your protagonist is not a perfect person, but you still mm-hmm. want them to succeed. You want them to be all right. Um, and those shows have been so massive. Um, and there's countless mm-hmm. other examples, but I think it's going to show that actually a woman can be a real person on screen. You don't have to make someone likable and have their sort of likability dial up to number 10 <laughs> in the test screenings for an audience to root for them or engage right. with them. Right. It's not like the likability dial is what's dictating your career decisions, mm. but you are, we are at a, we, I think you're right. We are at a moment in the industry where Fleabag and I may destroy you and, and promising young woman, mm. maybe even 10 years ago mm. would not have been made or would not have been as um, received mm. in such a way that audiences understand. Mm this woman, this character who happens to be a woman is flawed. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, I think there's just been something really interesting that's happened over the last 10 years where women have sort of taken control of the storytelling and yeah. are creating opportunities for themselves and to tell stories mm-hmm. about real women. And, you know, even started around sort of Olive Kitteridge and Frances McDormand setting that up. And, oh, sure. um, and then all of these sort of, longer format TV shows that have come and been such huge successes. I think, you know, it's all linked in a way. Um, and now I think it's the popularity of these shows and of people really being excited and um, avid viewers of of these kind of stories that sort of bred more of it. And it's Margot Robbie's company, of course, that produced Promising Young Woman yes. and she makes, you know, her whole mission is to do, to tell stories about women that feel you know, different and real and exciting. So I think there's, you know, a, there is a big shift from 10 years ago. That is really, it's it's a very encouraging. It's it's cool to hear. And of course, as, I mean, we are at Backstage and we are all about empowering the artist, but I think in particular the actor. What is your advice to someone who is at the earlier part of their career and does not mm. necessarily have their pick of roles? Mm. Mm. How do you navigate the industry in a way that <laughs> allows you to sleep at night? Mm. And that allows you to maybe even move that needle and make mm. it, you know, make a difference in representation on screen. Gosh, I mean, I think it's, you know, certainly you want to work as, I think, as work as much as you get the opportunity to um, mm-hmm. and learn as much as you can. Um, I think it's for other people to to move the needle in terms of representation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in the way that particularly kind of new contemporary writing um, is presented and that, you know, I think there's so many unnecessary character descriptions that limit certain actors having um, opportunities with roles Ah. um, where there's sort of unnecessary breakdowns of characters that, that, could be anybody. I think yeah. there's, we that if there's a bigger focus on sort of, I, I was speaking to a director the other day and I said, where's this, you know, where's this character from? And I was talking about sort of secondary character and they said, oh, well, he, she, you know, they, them is from anywhere. I don't care. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's so great. <laughs> um, so great. It, you know, it's just somebody who can tell a human story and it really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there's space for a lot more of that. Um, mm. 
so I'm I'm hoping that that um, and I and I think yeah I think you know things seem to be sort of slowly but surely moving in the right direction in that respect. Sure. Yeah. Um, it almost makes me want to ask about auditions too. Is it safe to say auditioning is not something that has been as much a part of your career since an, uh, an education? Uh, pretty much. I mean, I auditioned for the Cohen brothers, um, for Inside oh, Leon okay. Davis and, um, mm. and then actually auditioned for Maestro, um, which is my next job. Okay. So it was, um, so yeah, it's, it has, but in between those two things, mm -hmm. I think I've auditioned for a couple of things I didn't get mm. heartbreakers. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, but other than I mean, that, that's yeah, the, that's part of the gig. And it was yeah. um, a rigorous audition process for an education, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Over a kind of, well, it was a strange thing because it was, there was one of his original director and then that director left the project and it was a new oh. one. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing, I auditioned about three times over a year for different people. Um, so it was, yeah, that was, um, that was a long wait. Sure. Well, so going off this idea of like empowering artists and empowering mm. actors in particular, mm. what is your audition advice? Do you, do you think of yourself as a good auditioner? Is it a separate skill set from acting? I sometimes worry I'm too good at auditioning. And then when I get <laughs> to the actual okay. film, I'm somewhat of a disappointment because I don't do it as well on the day as I did in the audition. Um, so that always, uh, it always used to really freak me out. I remember doing this, I did this show called My Boy Jack with, Daniel mm -hmm. Radcliffe and we played he was um it was about Rudyard Kipling and his son who went to war and the audition scene when I did the audition I walked away and I was like mic drop nailed it Oscars yeah. for everyone I couldn't <laughs> have done that better and sure enough I got the job and I was like brilliant yeah. I got to the day of shooting that scene and I just tanked it I just could I just don't know what I just honestly it was like the worst acting not the worst acting I've ever done but pretty close mm -hmm. um so I don't know what that's about but I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I've always been incredibly nervous for auditions, but having somewhat been a little bit on the other side, like meeting with kids that I've worked with in films or meeting, sometimes doing chemistry reads with people, every person who walks into the room, you want them to be the answer. You want them to be that person. So I think uh, if I wish I'd known that when I started out, that actually you're not walking into a room of people who are somehow against you actually they're they're all sitting there thinking oh gosh i really hope this is the person who is the right person and also having done kind of chemistry reads and things with people i've also realized that it's very very seldom a meritocracy and it's very seldom mm -hmm. about who comes in and does the best performance it can so often be about a sort of particular fit and yeah. sometimes it's not like who's the person who comes in and does the most extraordinary thing. It could be just a quality that is different right. that fits in with a whole other puzzle of things. So if I'd known that, I think I would have been less crushed mm. after not getting some jobs and less nervous going in. But you know, it's not always about like being perfect. It's it's there's so many yeah. other considerations that people have. That's great advice. It really is true that you're a tiny puzzle piece. Yeah. Depending on the project, as as intricate, you know, fitting as intricately as possible into a giant picture, it's yeah. also so. I hadn't thought of that before. About you're not auditioning for a monologue; you're auditioning for a dialogue. You are you are there to fit in with other co-stars as well, and that decreases. The, I mean, that's also working against quote unquote working against you as an actor. <laughs> yeah, in a way. I mean, it's it really is, and it can be. Um, yeah, it's, it can be the sort of smallest reason, but I think it's it's you, you can kind of guard yourself against the real crushing disappointment things, knowing that. And I also yeah. think like if you go in and you're good, that's you, that will always stand you in good stead because mm -hmm. the amount of people who see those tapes, it doesn't just go to those two, three people in the room. It goes to so right. many people, and you know you could very well be immediately thought of for the next thing that any of those people do so you know that i don't know unless you really tank it which i definitely did a few times um you never need to sort of feel too bad after <laughs> well that's actually my next question i have to let you go soon but we asked this of everyone do you have like a worst audition horror story yeah i don't know if i've told like you guys to about this before it's like this is my worst audition have. ever horror story i auditioned for gravity for alfonso oh. Cuaron. 
Yeah. And uh, he was not able to be there. He was somewhere, he was like in Europe or somewhere. And I was staying in LA and I went to a casting office where I had to put on a spacesuit, including like yeah. a skull cap. And um, I can't remember if I had a helmet or not, but I definitely had a sort of my hair all scraped back from my face wearing this like big giant spacesuit. <laughs> and then I had to audition, I had to do the sort of spinning out of control in space part. Mm -hmm. on my own in a room with Alfonso Cuaron on Skype, <laughs> watching it from really? somewhere. And it was, I mean, even as I was doing it, I was thinking like, this might be one of the worst moments of my life. <laughs> I mean, and I actually sat down, I went to a dinner sort of two years ago when I was in town for wildlife and I was seated next to Alfonso Cuaron and I said like, oh. I just want to say, I'm so sorry. I just should. I just should have just. I should have walked away. I can't believe I put you through that on on Skype and you had to watch me spinning around like a lunatic screaming. Um, but that was pretty bad. That was a pretty bad one. But there's so many. I auditioned for Mamma mm. Mia, and uh, oh. at one point, and I remember when the tape came out of um, that actor and his Mamma Mia audition, um, and it sort of went viral, you know, because this oh. tape had come out and. And I didn't find it funny. I found it terrifying. I thought, what if my tape comes out? It's way worse than this. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine. I mean, it's just oh, awful no. to think, you know, what we've we've all kind of committed to camera. So yeah, there's definitely <laughs> a bunch of really terrible tapes out there. And I hope they that stay, is... I hope they're sort of burned somewhere. Right. That is so wild that um, your worst audition horror story is something as huge. It doesn't get bigger than Gravity and Mamma Mia, actually. Those are two huge projects. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. Well, I didn't get either of them, but yeah, no. yeah, totally. No. <laughs> no. And 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 your your attitude is just move on, right? I mean, it's part of the biz. You're going to get more no's than yeses. Most actors yeah, are. Yeah, totally. And I think it's it's okay to be, you know, to be. I remember I didn't when I didn't get Bright Star, I was desperate to I auditioned for Jane Campion and went through a whole audition process yeah. for that. And um when I didn't get that job, my agent sort of tricked me into getting me into the office so she could tell me because she didn't want to tell me over the phone because she knew I'd be uh, so sad yeah. so she was like I need you to come and sign something and then I came into the office and she handed me a <laughs> cup of sweet tea and was like you didn't get bright star and I, sort of, and I cried and but you uh, know yeah I mean you've you got to you've got to brush it off you got to kind of let go and keep going yeah yeah just and as you say your your audition advice was was spot on mm -hmm. um last question we asked this of everyone what is one performance you think every actor should see and why? Mm. Maybe something you've seen recently. Well, actually, no, I was going to say Nicole Kidman in To Die For. Um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. She was actually somewhat of an inspiration for us, a promising young woman. Um, okay, cool. She's just extraordinary. I don't know. I can't describe it in any other way. She's just extraordinary. And... And she's like a sort of, it's like someone playing a violin, um, like her emotions just go from one, one extreme to the other seamlessly. And it's, kind of, and she's sort of simultaneously charming and enticing and terrifying all at the same time. Um, and I think it's just a masterclass. What a great, that's such a, that's such a wonderful example. And in fact, how often is a, performance uh you know an actress maybe especially giving a performance informing one of yours that directly or inspiring you i mean that really was a sort of she definitely you know she was even actually a visual reference um in the mm. first mood board um nicole kidman um but it's i but actually most of the time i sort of try and avoid any sort of direct um I, I don't tend to watch anything you know directly before doing something mainly because i think i would just try and steal things so i didn't re-watch right. to die for before promising mm -hmm. i just I, I know and love the film so much um it was in my mind but i think uh i try not to sort of because i think i would just glean things and try and sort of steal ideas and probably wouldn't be a good thing um but i'm constantly inspired by people's work and makes me mm. want to it, and seeing people doing amazing work and uh, makes me want to get back to work and you know try and make something great i love that about film um mm. and yeah this year there's just crazy good films which is yeah. a, a real you know light at the end of a tunnel with 2020 <laughs> you get all these amazing films coming out so that's exciting totally 
Yeah, totally. Um, gosh, Carrie, thank you so much for all of this. Your um, your passion, I know, is so a part of your work. It really, really came through here, and I really appreciate you oh, shedding a light on that process. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi, guys. Christine McKenna Torella here, the backstage casting insider. Swooning over this week's guest, Carrie Mulligan. She's so fabulous and talented. I was lucky enough to catch a performance of Girls and Boys in a tiny theater in the West Village in 2018. It was truly a masterclass in acting. And if you missed it, It's actually recorded by Audible and you can listen to it there. So it's Girls and Boys, Carrie Mulligan, really wonderful performance. This week, I wanted to talk to you about New Year's resolutions. I know resolutions are a tad divisive as as people tend to be firmly never do a resolution and, uh, and others do it every year. And I think it's a nice opportunity to do an audit. You hear me talk about those all the time and refocus on some goals for your career. Here are my top tips for your career resolutions to make them stick. Limit the amount of resolutions so you don't feel overwhelmed. First step would be to make a list of things you want to work on. And then the second step to that is prioritize that list so you know what to work on first. Next, you should follow the SMART rules, right? I didn't make this up. I'm not smart enough to do that, but make it specific. The more details, the better. Make it measurable, set up guidelines so you can have concrete ideas about what success is for that goal. Make it achievable, make it relevant, which means make it matter and connect with your purpose and make it time bound. Set some limits around this. A goal of yours might be to land more auditions and book more jobs. And that's a really great goal. And I know you can do it, but it's too general right now. So apply the smart rules. I would start with a brainstorm session about how to go about this. And that's going to look slightly different for everyone. But here's a few ideas. One idea, set some times in your calendar every day to look on the site for casting calls. So maybe that's, you know, between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. when you're getting your coffee or whenever you wake up, go right on this site. And then maybe you do it a second time uh, at 2 p.m., something like that. Another idea is to set up Google alerts for articles about areas of the business you want to learn more about. If you want to land more auditions this year, mastering self-tapes is essential, right? So brainstorming on that, breaking that down a little bit more, making it a, a, a mini goal within itself. Definitely head over to our YouTube for our Casting Insider series. Um, Daryl Eisenberg covers how to make the best self tapes and she gives some really great insider knowledge. Review your current taping environment and set up a place in your home that is your self tape area if you don't already have it. Set up a mock audition for yourself. Record some material and watch it back with trusted mentors and colleagues to figure out ways in which you can improve the lighting, the audio and the setup. Make sure that's all correct. Get an accountability partner to help you keep on track and head over to your backstage community pages and start a conversation with your fellow actors. The above is by no means an exhaustive list and I've just like rifled through it there but you get the idea of how you can use the smart guidelines to make the goals more achievable and increase your follow-through if you didn't catch the justin simeon's episode i highly recommend you listening in on that for my tips on how to make your mission statement as an artist to help strengthen your why you're relevant right you are in the smart rules and your purpose also You know I love Secret Agent Man, Sam, as he's called. He's got a fabulous list this weekend backstage about seven New Year's resolution to kickstart your 2021 acting career. Okay, on to casting highlights for this week. Here's a high-paying regional gig for my Texas-based actors, particularly if you're around Fort Worth, casting two by two a themed production of TV and social spots for the Wyoming Lottery. Details on the site. There's a remote voiceover work from home nationwide opportunity for Curology for a promo there. Uh, Details on the site. And finally, for my UK listeners, there's casting for Peabody Guides, a guide to staircasing. Uh, And the synopsis is basically Peabody Homes are completing a series of educational films that explain key parts of their product. 
The actual filming dates are to be confirmed due to the restrictions that are back in London. However, they will work around production dates and the availability of the selected applicants. So that's pretty cool. That's all from me. Break a leg in all your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in The Envelope.